I am um, Senator Elena Parent and am honored to be the chairwoman of this particular study committee. Um, so we have all of our members here except Harold Jones, who I think will be joining us via Zoom from Augusta momentarily. So we expect to see a full attendance roster out of our senators. Um, I would actually like to let each member of our committee do a quick introduction. So Senator Harrell, why don't we start with you? Good afternoon. I'm Senator Sally Harrell. I represent uh, Senate District 40, which is uh, in the North Atlanta suburbs, um, mostly in DeKalb County, like Brookhaven and Chambly and Doraville and Dunwoody. Um, but it does go into Gwinnett County as well, um, like Peachtree Corners and Norcross area. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Appreciate your leadership for getting this committee organized and put together. Uh, John Albers, I serve the 56th Senate, State Senate District. I can't talk today. Uh, Cobb, a Cherokee, and Fulton County. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. The, uh, I'm Frank Ginn. The, uh, if you live in Georgia, I'm your senator. If you live in the 47th District, you decide how long. The uh, but, but for me, I, I'm fortunate to chair the Transportation Committee. <clears throat> I live so far out in the woods that, that uh, uh, not even a pizza delivery person will bring me food. So I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on the committee today and they, uh, look forward to good work about trying to solve a few problems for the people of Georgia. Excellent. Thank you so much, Senators. Um, and I should mention my district is um, wholly within DeKalb County. Um, and I've got kind of central to cab, let's call it. Um, all right, just a few housekeeping items before we really get started on substance. I want to thank Emily Doppel, who actually is um, one of Chairman Ginn, works with Chairman Ginn as one of her senators for filling in today for my wonderful assistant, Stephanie Tanner, who just got married, had her honeymoon and came back from the honeymoon with COVID after avoiding it for all of these years. So she's feeling great, but obviously is at home and she'll be watching us on the live stream. So thank you to Emily and to Senator Ginn for loaning her over. Um, and Catherine Russell with Senate Research Office has been just doing a tremendous job as our policy analyst and support from Senate Research for this particular study committee. And of course, we have all of our excellent staff who from um, Senate Press and Legislative Council who are supporting us today. So thank you. Um, so let's see, just a very brief recap of our first meeting. We we really heard from restaurants and folks from the Georgia Restaurant Association. We heard from Peter Dale with Maypole, Brian Husky, um, Ryan Pernice, all of whom are restaurant owners, and then Karen Bremer, who is the executive director, right? Yes, of the Georgia Restaurant Association, um, closed us out all discussing some, you know, challenges and um, benefits of their relationships with third-party delivery apps. A number of questions or themes that were repeatedly raised dealt some with food safety and regulation, as well as transparency around fees and contracts and the like. Oh, and let me mention, actually, we did have one more presenter, and I think I'm looking at him, um, Mr. Joe Reinstein with the Digital Restaurant Association, who also brought forth some similar themes. Um, let's see, that made me lose my train of thought for a second. But um, we in the in that space of the issues that that we were discussing, there were a number of inquiries around: could we hear something from Department of Public Health uh, who regulate our restaurants? And so we are going to kick off today's meeting hearing from the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, so let's see, I would like to call on Galen Baxter, who is the State Environmental Health Director for Georgia Department of Public Health. Here is Mr. Baxter. Okay. It should be on. All right, great. All right, good afternoon, Senators and Chairwoman. Thank you for inviting me over to uh, provide some insight from the regulatory standpoint for third-party delivery applications or third-party delivery companies. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview 
of what I know about these companies and the concerns and challenges since they're not regulated by uh, anyone in our industry or, or excuse me, anyone in our agency. Go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. So some of the challenges uh, that I'm aware of at this time are that there are no federal or consistent regulatory oversight. Another issue is that some of the uh, delivery drivers could cross state lines, which would potentially impact uh, jurisdiction for those um, companies or drivers. Uh, they also don't operate in a way that's related to any retail food service establishments, so they're not restaurants, so they wouldn't fall underneath um, our, our rules and regulations. What I do know is that there are some state and local jurisdictions that have patchwork regulations. So we have a lot of municipal um, codes and ordinances that cover specific things related to this. And most of it, from what I can tell at this point, focus more on the fair labor practices for the delivery drivers, um, also uh, instilling caps on fees that the uh, third party delivery companies can instill on the restaurants. Uh, and then also listing restaurants without their consent on their websites. Um, so another issue of concern is the accountability or the enforcement. So again, since they really don't fall under any kind of um, you know regulatory agency here in Georgia, who who would enforce this or anywhere in the country for that matter? That that's been a, a concern. And then also they have different methods of delivery. So we're not just talking about vehicles. Uh, we could have people delivering on scooters or bicycles or even walking. So you have different elements of concern depending on the method of delivery, uh, you know, that the food is being transported. You can go to the next one. Okay. Uh, there are some recent developments, however, um, that Iowa has just in, uh, passed a law which regulates the third-party delivery application companies, and that part of that law includes regulating uh, the holding temperatures, making sure the, the containers are sealed. Um, they also put a, a regulation on who can ride in the car with them. They don't need to have dogs, kids, or anything like that. Uh, and then also the smoking or vaping and prohibiting that. That just took effect this past summer in June. Uh, so if you'd like more detailed information on that, then our government affairs team can can uh, fill in those gaps for you. Um, additional regulations that I, that I found were in New Jersey and Tennessee. Um, they have laws that regulate the, the delivery of alcohol, and it included um, DoorDash and Uber Eats and some of those, but I, I don't know who enforces um other than the Department of Revenue, that was the only thing I could find. They had specific guidelines in place for the delivery of the alcohol. I don't know if it included the food deliveries with that as well. Um, I know that we have some representatives here uh, from Ruber, so they may be able to speak more clearly to that. And then finally, um, about two years ago, the Conference for Food Protection released a guidance document that has best practices listed for these third-party delivery application companies. Uh, but it's not enforcement, enforceable, excuse me. And it also includes not just DoorDash, Uber Eats, and things like that, but other companies like Instacart, where you can have somebody go and buy your groceries for you and, and bring it and deliver it to your home. So it included a whole bunch of different types of uh, delivery companies. Okay, can we go to the next one. Mr. Baxter, if you pause for a minute, I see. Uh... Senator Ginn has an urgent question. Senator Ginn. Yes. If, if you don't mind, because I, I do look at cooked food and, and raw food coming from a grocery store. Do you have some of the rules that, that you've seen with, you know, grocery delivery? The, uh, what, what happens with those? I, I don't know, you know, and to me, I could see a lot of crossover between the two. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I don't, Senator, because that uh, the Department of Agriculture regulates the grocery store industry. So, and the delivery of groceries is now. I don't know if that's included in their rules and regulations. I, I don't I know. know. I know the department does grocery stores and right. uh, food service places that don't have seating, but I, I right. don't know that that you know how the delivery mechanism. To, where that falls in the state regulations, right? And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think they do because I mean we've we've had you know, some conversations between the two agencies about that. And to the best of my knowledge, they don't have anything either 
for that. Would, would that be something that we need to explore? The reason I ask is, mm -hmm. I'll just be honest with you. I, I go to some of these big box places mm -hmm. that, that wholesales say, uh, and I'll go and I'll watch a guy in July wheel out milk in the, you know, dozens of gallons of milk put in the back of an unrefrigerated truck. And I'm thinking, probably not going to drink all that milk himself. And I just don't know, you know, how you, you deal with that. But I can right. see, you know, there, there are issues that I've seen in the food delivery, whether it be going to the home or going mm -hmm. to a uh, perhaps resale. Right. Well, I know that they also um, have a hand in regulating companies like Cisco with the delivery part of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they they require the refrigerator trucks and food to be delivered at certain temperatures. So but I'm not sure about that instance, maybe where it's going to a, a mom and pop establishment in the back of a pickup truck. I'm not sure. So you, you'd have to talk with them. Thank you. Yes, sir. OK, so uh, real quick, I kind of wanted to go over some differences uh, between the restaurant delivery and the third party company delivery. So with third party company delivery, uh, the employees are essentially hired by the consumer to pick up the food for them. Uh, the employees work for the third party delivery company uh, as contractors, from what I understand, some of them do. I don't know if all of them do. The, the employee for the third party delivery company is considered the end consumer by the restaurant. Because once the restaurant lets that food go, that's the end consumer to them. Then the third party delivery company will take control of the food for the consumer. And to, again, the best of my knowledge, I don't know that the third party delivery companies require any kind of radius. Uh, they don't determine that with when they set up their delivery services around the area. Whereas for restaurants, the consumer would actually order directly from the restaurant and the employees work directly for the restaurant. The restaurant would maintain control over that food until it is given to the customer. And the restaurant then can determine their delivery radius. So, you know, you would not typically see a restaurant that would be maybe in North Fulton deliver all the way down to Henry County because they know they can't get the food there in time where it's going to be hot or cold, however the, the customer ordered it. So you typically see a radius with delivery for a restaurant so they can maintain that control. Um, the Department of Public Health has jurisdiction over restaurant employees and the transport method. Now, do we go out and inspect delivery vehicles for like Pizza Huts or Papa John's? Not on a, as part of the routine inspection, no, because there are so many drivers and we don't know when each one of them works. However, if we were to get a complaint on a particular driver from a particular restaurant, then absolutely we could investigate then. Um, and we would make sure that that employee is, is following the requirements of employee health and hygiene, which is, I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And then last but not least, I just wanted to also throw in that caterers uh, are required to maintain food at specific temperatures during transport. And that is because they can go, you know, further distances than what a regular delivery would be. So if someone in, if a caterer in North Fulton had a wedding to go to in Savannah, you know, then that caterer will be required to hold that food in temperature in proper containers all the way from their base of operation down to Savannah. And that's the difference between catering and delivery. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so what I was speaking to earlier about the authority for the Department of Public Health, uh, in this case, we need to, when the food is under the control of the restaurant, then there are certain foods that require time or temperature to maintain their safety. And that would either be at the temperature of 135 degrees or higher or 41 degrees and below. Food has to be protected from contamination at all times. And uh, the restaurant is required to make sure that the employees are following proper health and hygiene requirements. And what I mean by that is, there are certain symptoms and diseases that employees are required to report to the person in charge or the, the permit holder. 
And then that permit holder person in charge would make a determination whether or not that employee is restricted or excluded from working in the restaurant. Employees are also required to, you know, maintain good hygiene, um, proper hand washing, hair restraints, no smoking or eating uh, in the food prep area. And then finally, uh, food must be kept in containers that are designed for food while they're in the restaurant's control. And so that concludes my slide presentation. Um, if, if you have any questions. All right. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Baxter. Um, Senator Harrell. Is this um, conference for food protection that the guidance you mentioned, um, is that available online? Yes, it is. Okay. And it's actually in your folder. Oh, excellent. Yes, uh, right here. It's kind of longish. <laughs> yes. And dense, but um, it is here. So you could, yes, peruse Perfect. that. Any follow up right now, Senator? Not yeah. right okay. now. It just seems like we may find recommendations in here. Um, Senator Albers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for the information that you provided to me after the last meeting about uh, some of the food uh, delivery apps that are specific to an individual, like the chefs and other things. And, yes. You know, I kind of go back and forth in this to be candid with you. Part of me loves the the ingenuity and innovation that somebody has by taking something they have at home uh, and making money from it, right? Mm -hmm. Just like anything else, you have something in the back of your garage and you put it up on next door Facebook marketplace and sell it and two people win. Right. I almost see the same sometimes when I think of somebody who's got a heck of a lasagna dish. However, there's also the same concerns of what happens based on the, the items that you just mentioned in a controlled right. environment. Uh, so I think it's something we have to continue to process here by which we can we can help entrepreneurs from the same point we can protect the public. So I just want to say thank you. And this is very helpful information. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Any other questions right now for Mr. Baxter? No? Okay. It's thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from um, Sean Bryant, who is also with DPH. Got it. Okay. She, it, it, Megan Andrews with DPH and Sean are here with us. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, all right, then. So then next on our agenda, we have Giovanni Castro with Uber Technologies. And you should be on. Testing. Sorry, one sec. Good afternoon, Chairwoman, Senators. Thank you for having me. Is it kind of is it fun? Tilled it up. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My name is Giovanni Castro. I'm here on behalf of Uber Eats providing testimony. I like to, to thank the committee for allowing me to speak briefly about our business, how we partner with restaurants, and the important steps we take to keep customers and merchants safe while using the platform. For those who do not know much about us, Uber Eats is an online marketplace that connects restaurants with consumers and independent contractors offering delivery services. As outlined in our Merchant Impact Report, within the last year alone, Uber Eats has facilitated more than $11 billion in sales for U.S. merchants. This money has rippled through local economies, stimulating even more growth. In the U.S., more than 400,000 business partners with Uber Eats across 50 states. While the majority of our partners are currently restaurants, Uber Eats supports a wide range of businesses, including grocery, convenience, and retail merchants. In Georgia, we're proud to partner with over 14,000 restaurants and merchants in 155 cities and municipalities. Of those 14,000 restaurant partners, 51% of them are small to medium-sized businesses. And just last year, Georgia partners earned $420 million and revenue through the Uber Eats application. In short, Uber Eats is an important channel for merchants to reach new and existing customers, increasing the revenue and grow their business. This is incredibly important now more than ever, particularly in Georgia, as restaurants and businesses work harder to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. These last two years have been trying for restaurants and merchants, and we know that independent owned businesses continue to face significant challenges. Throughout the pandemic, the pandemic, we remain committed to supporting restaurants, providing 20 million in support efforts in 2021, 
to help local restaurants in U.S. and Canada, including $4.5 million to small business relief grants. Just the last week, through our Grants for Growth program in partnership with Visa, we announced our latest round of grantees, which included restaurants right here in Georgia, which will receive $10,000 in relief grants, business recovery support, as well as marketing support through our own partnerships and analysis through our done, done through our merchant impact report. A few of the restaurants that I'd like to highlight in Georgia that were recipients were Triple K Eats, Hoodlicious, and Off the Hook Crab and Fish. In addition to the financial commitments we've made to our restaurant partners, we've also worked closely with industry advocates, including the National Restaurant Association. Through that partnership, we listened to restaurants and developed a list of guiding principles for food delivery. And we continue to hear from restaurants on important issues affecting them, such as pricing plans. Last year, we announced pricing options to fit the needs of individual restaurants. Restaurants and merchants can tailor their plans to their business. So if they want to keep their costs low and only need a, new, a few services from us, they can have that. These multiple pricing plans give restaurants the flexibility they need to serve their customers and grow their business. As restaurants and merchants determine which plans work for them, they can make those adjustments. As I wrap up my testimony today, I want to highlight the efforts we made to keep our platform safe. We take food safety very seriously. Not only does Uber Eats stand for safety, we are a leader in the industry. We are in line with recommendations from third-party experts. We work with a partnership for food safety education to provide education to safely deliver restaurant-prepared meals and groceries, which delivery people can access throughout their time on the platform. Uber Eats is also a member of the Conference for Food Protections Coalition, which created a guidance document for third-party delivery service food delivery. And we are committed to helping ensure food safety by sharing information on relevant food safety standards in our community guidelines, which, deliver, which our delivery people commit to following. We also encourage couriers to use insulated bags throughout their experience working on the Uber Eats platform. And we recommend that restaurants use safe packaging solutions, such as tamper evidence seals. Finally, we, we also leverage our algorithm to maintain temperature control and ensure efficient delivery times when it comes to matching a consumer to the courier. During the August hearing, we heard some concerns about fake restaurants or home cooks using the third party applications. It is important for the committee to know that we only work with certified merchants that abide by food preparation and hygiene regulations, and we share customer feedback with them. As outlined in our Uber Eats community guidelines, restaurants are expected to meet all relevant licensing requirements and to follow all food regulations, including food safety regulations and, industries and industry best practices. Restaurants must maintain valid restaurant license and or permits, and any restaurant found to be without a license or following the local laws would be in violation of our partnership agreement and would therefore be deactivated from our Uber Eats platform. We have a rigorous screening process that analyzes restaurant licenses, health inspection data, and restaurant location to ensure they are a legitimate business and reduce fake restaurants and home operations when they arise. Uber Eats is proud to partner with Georgia restaurants and merchants. We look forward to working with our partners and this committee to ensure that Georgians and Georgia businesses benefit from using our platform. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Castro. I've got a couple questions and I imagine probably some other members of the committee do as well. Um, I should mention that uh, for everyone's edification, I believe that Mr. Horl with um, DoorDash, who's on Zoom, is also going to be providing us some testimony. So just to, to let everybody know about that too. So, um, so first question, and thank you so much for being with us and for um, what Uber Eats is doing. Um, do you have a contract? Do, does Uber Eats have a contract with every restaurant that it picks up with, with our merchants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We have, we have certain contracts with them to make sure that they are following our standards on the platform. And um, how many of your restaurants use a standard contract versus an individualized contract? Th that question I have to get back to you on. Yeah, okay. Is it possible to do a individualized contract with a restaurant? I'd have to check on, on that one. 
but thank you for asking. Um, so you mentioned briefly training and requirements that you that Uber Eats adopts to protect food safety, including, I think, asking delivery people to commit to follow to certain guidelines and recommending insulated bags. Um, I guess my question is, are those both requirements or are they suggestions? And what what um, requirements does Uber Eats have for drivers and vehicles related to food safety, temperature control, radius and and all of uh, sort of those other things. Yeah, we, we follow the local guidelines. Um, we adopt in our community guidelines to ensure that the temperature control is following the local jurisdiction. And also with when it came to, I guess I mentioned algorithm maybe before with technology, we've also modified. So, you know, the couriers are there within the vicinity of the restaurant and they're not going too far of a distance. I, I believe the previous individual mentioned kind of, you know, certain things going a far distance from certain areas, you know, there, there is a certain radius for where you are able to order from a merchant and to, and to arrive at your home or to the capital here, things of that nature. Thank you. So when you say you follow local guidelines about temperature, does that mean your drivers are required to have our drivers are independent bags. contractors, so you know we they they aren't our employees. We make sure that they adhere to our guidelines. We we try to get them to they they work on that and they uh, and we message that appropriately, especially in markets such as this, that we want to ensure you know the the delivery standards and the temperature standards are met. But you don't actually have any like control over exactly what they're doing. Is that? To understand that, Somewhat, right? yeah. I mean, there are markets where we have certain, you know, bags that we can help with those things. But in terms of like, we suggest more of the insulated bags, but what they're also picking up is from the restaurant itself. They're getting the food prepared in the containers from the restaurant. Okay, thank you. Um, I might have some more later, but I want to give others a chance. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Castro. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Castro. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, very informative, certainly. Uh, as the relationship continues to evolve over time. Uh, you know, I'm a free market person, but the same point is, is we want everybody to win. We, we, we need and want our restaurants to win, right? And to be able to have a good profitable business, just like we do, we want Uber to or any other company that does that. So how do you foresee um, the work you've already done and continue to do over the next maybe year or two to strengthen that partnership to make sure that at the end of the day, everybody can be a good profitable businesses and consumers can be protected. Yeah. as And thank you for the question, Senator. As I mentioned previously, when it came to pricing and, and making sure that we're tailoring it to the merchant's needs, you know, we're here to complement uh, a lot of the services that the merchants are looking to execute on, especially on the delivery front. And we want to make sure that we're there to provide the resources at you know a certain cost-effective value proposition when we look at certain things that we're tailoring specifically when it comes to either the marketing or trying to get certain brand opportunities out to them. We want to make sure that this free market thrives down here in Georgia, and we want to complement those efforts through our Uber Eats platform. Thank you. And then uh, uh, you got a little assistance from a friend in the crowd that uh, restaurants can, in fact, have their own individual contract. So. Thank you. <laughs> Other members? Unless you want me to come up with one. No. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we always love to hear your, your questions. I mean, is what I meant to say. Um, let's see, Senator Harrell. All right. A few questions. Uh, you mentioned this list of guiding principles. Um, is, is that something we could review? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I have a couple of links to it. If you want, I can sh share with, with, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I can share with the links. Okay. Towards, yeah. And then you'll get that to us. Okay. Um, and then you said you were, uh, you are a member of, and you said an organization. Can you repeat that please? Yes. One sec. The National Restaurant Association and the that's not the one Conference that... for Food Protection Coalition. Oh, that's that's the one that the other speaker referenced. So that's the same 
guidance. Okay. Um, and then when you refer to sealed food, what is a seal? What constitutes a seal? Is, is that just like a sticker that if it's broken, then you know it's been unsealed? Or can you describe to me the, the tamper evidence seals? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'd have to check with our team to get you a, a strong definition on how you how you want to you know define us. Yeah, I'm curious as to what what constitutes uh, tamper a package of seal. food yeah. being sealed or tamper resistant. Yeah. Okay. So, do you have? I guess I'm a little confused about what what y'all have is kind of like recommendations and things that are hoped for and and um, sort of recommended to the drivers versus what requirements you make of drivers. Pardon, pardon me? In terms of the transport of the food and the food safety, like does, do you have any requirements related to their vehicle or the transport? Like, like the age of the vehicle or? Just or anything. The... Yeah, yeah. I mean, like they, they go through a certain uh, like inspection process, similar to our, our ride share vehicles. But I, I could check on the standards, like the safety standards. If you want me to send you something on that for eats and, and rides, I can. I can. Send yes, I yeah. So that's for the that's for, and that's for the vehicle itself. Yeah, I'll, I'll I can send those to you. Yeah. Okay, and then what? And then what about? I'm still a little confused about the food transport part, though. Are there requirements or are they recommendations? They're guidelines, so they're somewhat recommendations. I can. As I okay. mentioned previously, yeah. I can send those guidelines to you all. Yes, we would like to see them. I mean, I just wanted to clarify that they're not actually mandated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. By the company. Yeah. And 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 just to also get back to Senator Albers mentioned, you know, in, in terms of assisting the, the merchants here, you know, a lot of what we also kind of the fees that we collect and things of that nature go back into onboarding new delivery people, ensuring that, you know, we're maintaining safety on our platform for insurance costs, getting proactive equipment to help the delivery individuals and marketing our merchants as well. So just also wanted to make sure I. There you go. Thank you. I just have, I have two more questions. Sorry. I'm so loquacious. Um, can you break down the um, fee structure for us? I'd have to get back to you on the fee structure. Okay, I would uh, like to see that. I'm curious how much goes to the driver, how much, you know, how the tip works and whether any of it's transparent to the customer or ways that you try to have it be transparent to the customer. Are you aware of any any of that? Yeah, I mean, when you when you get your bill, you can see the the kind of breakdown of the different costs when you look at it previously. I'm not sure it tells me um, how many of the fees go to the company versus the driver. Okay. We can, we can definitely take a look on that and look for a breakdown for you. No, hold on. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I appreciate that. I'm not sure that's appropriate for us to know. I think that's a private business decision, right? However, they, they pay their employees to do that. Now, I can understand what the consumer yeah. has, et cetera. But, but I think when it gets behind the wall of the private business, I think that's probably their, their decision how they're going to. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah the, the I, I actually am more interested in the fee structure overall between right. the restaurants. Yeah, that's what I think. Yes. Is. That's what yes, I, I agree with you. I think you're right. Delivery, yes. Yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I think we have, I don't think it's totally inappropriate, but I see what I see your point. Um, and lastly, so I'm interested in this law and that they passed in Iowa, where I think they just required to, to ensure that there was a contract and just certain regulations around the transport of the food insulated bags, no pets in the car, et cetera. Is that something that you you all think is reasonable? I, I personally haven't worked on that legislation or, or seen it previously. If the health department wants to, you know, send it over based on, you know, what they include in their presentation, you know, happy to have a dialogue. Okay. So you're not sure where the company would fall on, no. on that. You're not sure. No, it's not my, uh, not my, what I currently oversee in my territory currently. Okay. Yeah. I think they, it's um, transparent. Yeah, you have to have a contract, food safety standards for delivery drivers, and food delivery companies will face fines if drivers are caught eating some of the food. Yeah, once again, I'd love to take a look at the legislation that was passed in Iowa. Okay, thank you so much. Um, anything further for Mr. Castro? Nope. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Um, let's see, Mr. Horrell with DoorDash, are you going to... Enlighten us now. Oh, there he is. Great. 
you know, let's see, is he automatically on or do I need to do something related? Okay, thank you so much. All right, you have the floor. Thank you for joining us and it's good to see you again. Yeah, thank you. And apologies that I could not be there in person. Unfortunately, my wife was already going to be out of town today. So I've got to, I got, I'm on kid duty the next few days. So, <laughs> uh, but Senator Perry, I want to thank you and members of the committee for the opportunity um, to speak with you today. I wanted to begin today by providing a brief overview of DoorDash and our business. Our company was founded nine years ago with the goal of growing and empowering local economies. Our founder, the son of a Chinese immigrant who ran a restaurant, wanted to provide a service that supported restaurants and help connect them to more customers and grow their business. The company was started and operated by grad students who attended class during the day and made food deliveries for local restaurants at night. Last year, DoorDash made 1.39 billion deliveries worldwide and helped generate $30 billion of revenue for merchants. In Georgia, 321,200 dashers or delivery drivers made deliveries from 18,500 merchants and earned an average of $20 per hour while working on the platform. How does DoorDash support restaurants? Without restaurant partners, our service does not exist. We've built strong partnerships with restaurant owners and operators, state restaurant associations, and national restaurant associations, because we are working every day to improve our services and help restaurants grow their business. In fact, Atlanta's own Pinky Cole, the founder and owner of Slutty Vegan, who herself was once a dasher, is currently serving as DoorDash's chief restaurant advisor. As a business owner that operates multiple brick and mortar restaurants, food trucks, and the sale of products at various retail locations, she sees the value that delivery can provide and currently works with other restaurants and DoorDash alike to advise on ways to help make the service work better for everybody. DoorDash also has a restaurant advisory committee, which is made up of hundreds of restaurants on the DoorDash platform. DoorDash convenes this group regularly throughout the year to seek input from these restaurant partners on improvements we are making to the service. Atlanta also served as the site of one of our first restaurant accelerator programs. Restaurant owners and operators participated in an eight-week course that provided an immersive curriculum designed to help restaurant owners grow their business, covering top topics such as marketing, technology integration, managing cash flow, and menu creation. Each participating restaurant owner received a $20,000 grant in addition to countless networking opportunities with the goal of helping to grow their business. Throughout the pandemic, DoorDash provided $200 million in grants and direct relief to restaurants, and we continue to do so through a variety of programs like the Restaurant Accelerator and Accelerator for Local Goods programs. We also work to provide support for local food banks and nonprofits th through a program called Project Dash. After hearing from community partners the trouble they have getting food and other goods to those in need, Project Dash was launched to help fill that void by utilizing the existing delivery network we have developed to deliver food from food banks to those facing food insecurity. This program operates at little to no cost to our com local community partners. Dashers get paid the same as they would for food delivery from a restaurant. To date, we have made an estimated 2 million deliveries of over 35 million boxes of food nationwide. We are also proud to have partnered with the City of Atlanta as a part of the White House Conference on Hunger, Health, and Nutrition, which was unveiled just one week ago. This is a public-private partnership intended to help nonprofits get food and resources, such as community credits, in the hands of those facing food insecurity today. Atlanta is one of 18 cities across the country to partner with us in this endeavor. Who are these dashers? They are football and baseball coaches, church elders, veterans, teachers, mothers, grandfathers, even college students. 58% are women. They are your neighbors and members of nearly every community across the state. The vast majority do not dash as a full-time job, as 90% of them work less than 10 hours per week on our platform. In Georgia, the average dasher spent only two hours per week active on our platform last year. Dashers often rely on this type of work to help pay for back to school supplies, their child's birthday party with their friends, or an upcoming family vacation. During the pandemic, many became dashers to help pay the rent when work hours were decreased or they were furloughed. Some dashed while looking for a new job. 
Dashing is an opportunity for people to work on their terms and when it is most convenient to them. It is flexible and provides a pathway to earnings opportunities that did not exist until recently. 90% of dashers prefer to maintain their ability to remain as independent contractors and maintain this flexibility. Every dasher must apply and pass a background check. They must also meet a set of, a, meet a set of standards that is required to ensure the, the, that the service meets expectations. Our business operates a three-sided marketplace made up of restaurants, dashers, and customers. If any one of those three parties does not see value in the service or that value is diminished, the service cannot exist. Customers have definitely seen the value of food delivery in recent years, which is why the service has grown. Until recently, many communities could only get pizza or Chinese food delivered. Today, delivery platforms provide restaurants the unique opportunity to serve their regular customers but it also allows restaurants to reach new customers, many of whom are otherwise unlikely to find out about or visit their restaurant. Restaurants on the DoorDash platform choose to partner with DoorDash's service and every restaurant has ownership over setting their menu and prices on the platform. They have agreed to the terms of the partnership, including the fees associated with the package of services they opt into, as well as the terms and conditions associated with the service, such as sharing intellectual property for promotion on DoorDash. Like any business, restaurant operators must weigh the benefits with the cost of the service. Some wanted cu the customers to bear more of the cost, while others have seen firsthand the decline in volume from customer demand when customer fees are increased and prefer to pay more. Some see the benefit of our customer subscription program Dash Pass, which waives delivery fees for a low monthly charge for customers and are willing to pay more. Why? These are the customers that are making multiple orders each month and or week and could generate much more order volume for a restaurant. With that being said, we must also keep the customer and the dasher in mind and ensure that the three-sided marketplace can remain balanced, much like a three-legged stool. Dashers, still need to see the value in earnings to continue making deliveries. Customers must also not bear the brunt of high prices that could drive them away from placing orders. Commissions that restaurants pay on each order mostly go towards Dasher pay. Again, Dashers earn $20 per active hour on the platform on average in Georgia. Commissions also go towards Dasher insurance, which we provide every Dasher while active on the platform customer service, which is available for customers, merchants, and dashers alike. Commissions also go towards paying for the technology that drives the platform. And 3% of the commission goes to pay for the credit card processing fee, which would normally already be paid for by the restaurant. Every business is different, and we believe restaurants in Georgia that choose to partner with DoorDash should be able to select the products and services that are right for them. We enable local restaurants to choose a pricing plan with a delivery commission rate as low as 15%, with the ability to add additional services and options. We also continue to offer Storefront, our commission-free option that enables restaurants to get online and receive orders directly through their website. The only charge that the restaurant sees is a 3% charge for the credit card processing fee. Our plans are highly flexible and the restaurant can change its level of service at any time. We also go to great lengths to support the restaurants that use our platform. Restaurants are paid, are paid for any canceled orders that they have already begun preparing for delivery or any orders that are prepared and not picked up. We offer communication tools to help restaurants promptly communicate with either a dasher or customer if a pickup is running late. And we allow restaurants that have bad experiences with a particular dasher to avoid using that dasher in the future. Legislation at cap commissions has been introduced each of the past two years in Georgia. While DoorDash understands why some states and localities adopted these measures during times when indoor dining was shut down completely or restricted, such measures created unintended consequences in all localities where they were adopted. In all instances, DoorDash maintained our contracted service with our merchant partners. But in many cases, customer fees were increased to cover the cost of the service. I would refer back to the three-legged stool that represents the marketplace. If one leg is bearing less of the brunt, the chair wobbles because one or both of the other legs are forced to take on more weight.
While commission caps reduced what restaurants paid, customers more bore more of the cost. Increased customer costs leads to fewer orders on the platform, which means fewer opportunities for merchants to attract new customers and fewer earnings opportunities for dashers. With indoor dining back, mask mandates gone, and vaccinations available nationwide, our hope is that we are past such government intervening measures in the marketplace, and that restaurants can once again choose the service that will help grow their business the best at a reasonable price. Personal customer data is something that DoorDash takes very seriously. While we recognize the need for restaurants to reach their customer base, we also have obligations to users of the Dasher platform. Because of existing privacy laws, we go to great lengths to ensure our customers' data is secure. Beyond our legal obligations, this is a matter of building trust with our customers. We work to meet the and exceed their expectations with respect to safeguarding their personal information. We offer multiple op options that fairly balance the competing needs of protecting customer information and in supporting restaurants. First, we offer several options for restaurants to build their brand online with our storefront and drive products. These tools allow restaurants to control their web presence and fully own the customer relationship. Second, for restaurants that would rather take advantage of the DoorDash platform, we provide a range of customer analytics to support our restaurants and help them be successful. Restaurants' extensive information about order trends, order geography, fulfillment metrics, and the ability to connect with customers through our ratings feature, we are continually developing our merchant analytics to help find new and innovative ways to give restaurants meaningful and actionable data. In closing, I wanted to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. We're very proud of the service we provide to all partners, restaurants, dashers, and customers alike, and very much look forward to continuing to help restaurants and other businesses grow to reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gale. That's um, very informative, and you touched on many things. So we appreciate um, your presentation very much and your presentation to the committee. Um, just a couple questions. So you mentioned, did you say there are four standard level contracts? And I can't hear. There, there, there. Okay. Yeah, sorry. We have this weird disconnect between your volume and our volume somehow. Like you were really loud for us. So we oh, had to- I'm sorry. Not your fault. But then apparently that made me really soft. So we're, 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 we're playing, playing around with it down here. So anyway, I just was thanking you for your, um, your detailed testimony and a um, couple questions. What so you mentioned? Did you say there are four levels of standard contracts with restaurants with different different options and fee levels? Yes, so, yes, correct. There, so there is the commission free option, which is storefront, which basically you know door. It's our technology that that would essentially power the ordering um, for delivery through that through that restaurant that the. the um, you know, that the restaurant can adopt. They, they use their web presence. They own the, the customer relationship. Um, the only charge that they have is 3% for that credit card processing fee. And then on our marketplace, on the DoorDash marketplace, there are three tiers of pricing. There's a 15%, 25, and 30. 15% gets you basic delivery, a delivery radius of around, I want to say it's it's going to vary by from market to market, but it's around four and a half miles about, I would say, um, up to the 25, you also get access to our um, customer subscription program, a wider um, delivery radius, a lower customer fee. And then at the 30%, obviously even wider radius, um, access to Dash Pass. But the big thing on the 30% is you also get the guarantee of a minimum of 20 orders per month through the platform, or else all commissions are waived for that month. So there's a little bit more value at the higher um, commission levels. And it's also important to note that, you know, we're not like a cell phone company where you you um, pick a plan and you're stuck with it for a year or two years or whatever. You can toggle back and forth on a weekly basis or as needed. Great. And I think you mentioned that sometimes if, if a restaurant wants something specific, they would be able to negotiate that with DoorDash? Yes. Yeah, so restaurants are able to negotiate um, their own contracts as well. Um, obviously, I think that 
there's, you know, there, I think each each instance is a little different, but I think that, you know, particularly some of the larger restaurants that are driving much more volume through the platform are in a dip, sometimes a different place than some smaller restaurants that are only doing five, 10 orders a month. Right. So it, a lot of it just depends on what, you know, what does the volume look like um, and what does that other contract look like uh, or what does that negotiated contract look like from both sides? And, you know, and I think the in most instances, the restaurant would have to decide, is that a better deal than the standard packages? Right. That makes sense. I mean, I think the testimony we heard from restaurants was that if you were really big, you could kind of negotiate one. But if you're small, you really can't. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, well, I think there's also, a, I think the question would be, you know, what do you define as really big or really small? I mean, there's some restaurants that, you know, have three locations that have, a, that can have a negotiated contract. You know, there's some, I don't know about if, if there's any examples of, of one, but again, it all, it, I think it has less to do with, you know, how many locations they have and what kind of volume are you talking about? More number of orders then. Yeah, yes. Right. The number Correct. of okay okay um what um same question that i that i was pinging um uber eats on mr castro what what training requirements do you have for drivers related to vehicle and and food safety and and training yeah i mean we have a set of guidelines that we uh that they must adhere to they must agree to and adhere to we can share that with you as well they agree they agree they adhere to it Say that again. I'm sorry. That, that the driver, the dashers must agree to adhere to it. Yeah. So it's it's basically, you know, what are the expectations for delivery service? And I think, as I mentioned in the um, testimony as well, you know, the dasher is rated on every delivery. Um, they're rated by the restaurant. They're rated by the customer. Obviously, as issues arise or if there are problems that came from the delivery that, you know, um, they are they are investigated. And obviously, if they did not meet the expectations, did not meet those guidelines, then you know, we either remove them from the platform, um, we remove them from dashes to that restaurant or to that customer. Uh, but we definitely take steps to ensure that the problem is um uh, rectified. Great. Any um other questions? None from you, Senator. Uh Senator Harrell. Um, we had requested links for the guidelines for Uber. Maybe we should have, if possible, the the links uh, for your guidelines. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, one other um, topic that we hadn't really talked about, but you mentioned in your testimony related to the personal customer data. So the restaurants don't have do or do not have the data from the customer it depends on what which program they're involved in if if it's a if it's say drive or um on storefront they own the customer so they have all of that data that is theirs because they own that customer relationship that is going through their website um the order is pl being placed through them um if it's on marketplace, that's a little different because it's actually coming through our platform. And we are able to provide restaurants like the analytics so they can see, you know, what menu items obviously are generating the most orders. Um, what is what is that radius, you know, that they're that the orders are coming from? Um, you know, things like that. But it's 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 not at quite as limited because obviously from the customer perspective, like they've chosen to place that order through DoorDash. In that instance, so we also have to um, maintain a certain level of privacy on their end as well. And then, obviously, we also have to make sure we maintain their data in that instance as well. What do you think about? Um, it, it was mentioned that you know, like you can go to all the the um, travel websites, like the Expedia's and the Pricelines and the and the you know, et cetera, et cetera, kayak, but and, and rent a car and get a hotel room and book an airline flight, but but the end. Um, vendor gets the data why is it different here i think it's different because the kayak is not fulfilling that reservation kayak does not own the hotel they're not the one you know providing the service to that customer at the hotel taking them in when they check in providing room service whatever that looks like 
Um, I do think that, you know, it's comparable to what would be the storefront or drive um, platforms that we do provide all restaurants where the, the restaurant is able to own that customer. So that would be a similar instance, but as it pertains to the marketplace, that is not, it's just, it's, it's because DoorDash and the Dasher are fulfilling the order in that instance. Okay. So follow up. up. So with, um, storefront, they go to the customer website. I mean, the, the customer is on the restaurant's website. Correct. I've, what is it? We're providing the technology for the order to be placed. And what to put it in um, perspective, um, we saw actually at the beginning of the pandemic, obviously when in some localities, some jurisdictions where indoor dining was, you know, fully restricted, obviously, you know, they were looking for ways to connect with customers. A lot of Restaurants in some places did not have a way to for people to go online and or, make place an order. And obviously, we're in an age where the the yellow pages aren't what they once were if they still exist in a different community in different communities. So we we actually made storefront free of charge um, over the co- majority, I think, of the over the course of the majority of the pandemic for um, small restaurants because they needed some ability to have a web presence. Storefront actually provides what is that ordering technology on a website if they so choose. So it's utilizing their website, but it's the technology to place the order is being powered by DoorDash. And Drive is, did you, was that Drive? So drive, it's it's a little different where it, with drive, most of the orders are actually placed ahead of time. So it's it, the, for the customers that have a, a, con, a drive contract with us, it's it's like, you know, they know there's going to be an order that needs to be delivered at noon tomorrow. So the order is being placed through the merchant, through the restaurant, and then they're utilizing that, you know, what is our delivery network for the delivery. Okay, excellent. Thank you for explaining all those in more detail. I was a little confused about the, and I think I have a, and I can get this to the committee. I think I have a, a graphic that you sent me at one point, Mr. Roll, that was the four things. So I, I, I was actually looking for it and I can't find it, but I'll, I'll, it's, it, it might be in my office. Yeah, yeah. I, I can also resend it if needed. Okay, well then I probably have it on my email as well. So, all right, great, thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Hurl? Nope. Okay, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your testimony and being with us today. Thank you. Next, we have um, Karen Bremer with Georgia Restaurant Association. You're on. Yeah, Senator Parent and um, your committee members, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And uh, also thank you for your team. All your staff members have been very helpful in organizing everything. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Appreciate everybody's hard work on this issue. Um, This is not an issue that just came up yesterday. We've actively been working on trying to educate our elected officials on very all different forms of business in the restaurant industry. That is my job as an advocate for the industry so that you understand and then through awareness that, that our customers understand what is going on and then we educate our restaurateurs on how to comply and what are the new innovations coming on. Um, I'll be talking about this in a minute, but this is um, currently a map of uh, where you have third-party consent laws, where the third-party delivery companies need permission to deliver a uh, restaurant's food. And Daniel, do you have the, um, the handouts? Yeah, we have a list for you, a very voluminous list of legislation that's been passed around the country, uh, either governing or or mandating certain things uh, related to third-party deliveries. 
And um, first off, I want everybody to understand that our uh, association totally supports innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm a product of the industry. I'm celebrating my 48th year in the industry, started as an hourly employee, was president of a restaurant chain, was a owner of independent fine dining restaurants um, here in Atlanta. And the association hired me 12 years ago um, to be their, their president and CEO and to uh, ensure that uh, the state of Georgia elected officials uh, understood what restaurants bring to our community in terms of uh, job creation and in terms of opportunities for people to expand a business to create a dynasty and financial security for the families. Um, so with, with that being said, there's also a couple of things I want to clarify. And the National Restaurant Association has been mentioned many times throughout this. The National Restaurant Association is a separate organization that represents the nation's restaurants. Um, I have an affiliation agreement, a contractual obligation to provide services for their national members. However, we are an independent restaurant association. And uh, we collaborate on certain things, but we don't always necessarily agree on things. Here in Georgia, my board of directors, my executive committee, to whom I serve at their pleasure, are the ones that um, I work with to develop positions and standards and, um, and how we are going to advocate for our industry. So there's, there's separate entities here. Also, um, the Conference for Food Protection is an organization of scientists, food educators, um, restaurateurs, um, people from the CDC, from the FDA that gather every three years, they, they, they do an interim too between the three years, where scientific papers are presented as to what constitutes the latest uh, understanding of food safety. Uh, in, our, in our country. Um, back in the 1930s, um, uh, the U.S. Department of Public Safety was established through that, the FDA, and at that time, FDA rules were created to protect food safety in our country for our people. Um, I think you all have seen me bring up the 700-page book with me on occasion, and half of that uh, relates to agriculture, food production, food manufacturing, and half of it relates to food safety to protect our people from food that is um, uh, consumed away from home. Um, back, I'm going to reflect back to March of 2020. It was the Georgia Restaurant Association that became the advocate um, for restaurants actually surviving what was going to go into COVID. Um, I requested from Governor Kemp that restaurants be allowed to stay open for drive-through, carry-out, and for third-party delivery. We were supportive of that. People needed a lifeline. People needed to, to be able to get their, their food to their, cons to, to their customers. Um, we, we were also the organization to help many, many restaurants that had own an, own, no internet presence to get a website up and running so that they could uh, participate in e-commerce. They could figure out how to market to their customers, let them know that they had food. And, and that ha has been... Um, I, th I think some of y'all might remember we waived membership fees for all the almost 20,000 restaurants here in the state of Georgia, opened up our website and became the source of information for the industry, as well as we became the liaison between many of our elected officials and also our state um, officials, as well as the governor's office and the Department of Public Health. So going back to that, now that those are, are cleared there. And, um, and, you know, I will commend DoorDash. They, they did assist with uh, getting meals to people. I, along with some restaurateurs, started an organization called ATL Family, and we had out-of-work restaurant workers creating meals for unemployed restaurant workers, and DoorDash did deliver the food for us. We did pay them to deliver the food, but, but, they, but they did assist with that. Um, I, I think that I talked at length the last time I was here about, um, you know, some some of the issues that our restaurateurs have um, have encountered with the third party delivery systems with um, basically the appropriation of their intellectual property in terms of their brand in terms of their menu, not necessarily having current menus related, um, and the difficulty with getting unenrolled from a third party delivery service. Um, there, we've had numerous, uh, I believe several of the folks talked about that before, where we have issues where uh, people will contact a third party delivery and say, 
say, I did not give you permission to put me on your platform, get me off. They take it off. And then three weeks later, it comes back again. And that's still problematic out there. We're still hearing that on a consistent basis. Um, but I think what the most important point needs to be about third party deliveries is food safety. Um, here in Georgia, we adopted the FDA food code as our food standard back in 2006. And, and actually, it was a group of restaurateurs, including myself, private business people that started in 1991 to get the state of Georgia to adopt the FDA food code so that we would have consistent public safety standards throughout the state. Um, since the adoption of that, we are um, considered one of the better states. Not every state has adopted the FDA food code, um, but and prior to our adoption, we had 159 food codes and 535 food codes. So as someone that had multiple restaurants in the Atlanta area, it was a nightmare <laughs> to operate under, under those conditions. Um, but um, but so since we adopted, we have had one of the safest food um, systems in the United States. Our instances of foodborne illnesses are fairly limited and controlled and reported and, and, and definitely uh, made aware of. I work with um, other food um, it, uh, professionals on uh, monitoring what's going on and offering um, examples and information about things that are changing because there are several uh, task forces that work uh, specifically on food safety. Okay. Um, and in, in terms of, of, the, of the food safety, I think people should, should know that the food they are receiving was prepared from a licensed regulated establishment. And, um, and our, one of our concerns is that we have businesses that, that are not restaurants that the third-party delivery companies are picking up the food from. And um, I have a graphic image that I that I refer to that, but I'm not going to in this in, in this company uh, use that example. Um, but we have um, these systems are asking people to self attest to certain things. You are self attesting that you are. Um, um, that you have a business license, you are self-attesting that you have an EIN number, a, a sales tax ID, that you have the a food service permit, that you have uh, a trained, managed, a certified manager on premise. That is the law here in Georgia for, for a food service permit. It's not food handler, which is which is a program that we sort of that we provide certificates for for many thousands of restaurant workers. That is a very simple food safety course. It is not the certification that is required. That is a, a one. A class and a fairly uh, complicated test, but it is required in Georgia that there be one person in every food service establishment to have that. So many, a lot of these companies are asking their restaurants or their food providers to attest that they have these 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 uh, things in place. And I'll tell you, I know many restaurants that would love to self-attest that they have all of this and not spend, for instance, in the city of Atlanta, $75,000 a year on, on permits, licenses, and business taxes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice to set up a business out of your house, but where is the inspection and where is the monitoring of that? Um, and also, I, I find it um, somewhat disingenuous when, when we talk, when some of these um, organizations have been talking about inspections. Um, unless something has changed when Uber first started, they used to actually inspect the vehicles. I'm not aware that that has continued. In fact, I'm um, ninety nine percent sure that it's discontinued again. It's a self attesting, and we'd love for all people to be honest. But come on, let's 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 be realistic about that. And um, you know, we are here to um, hopefully create some sort of dialogue of what's going on. Um, none of the third party deliveries are members of our association, um, and uh, that has been uh, by choice of the organization. Um, they do belong to other state associations, the National Restaurant Association. They have provided grants for restaurateurs, uh, but unfortunately, they, ha they haven't worked through us because we don't. Um, allow them to be a partner of ours. And it's because of the issues that we constantly deal with on a daily basis on uh, failed business practices uh, for our restaurants. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bremer. Any questions, anybody? Okay, Senator Albers. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate the industry and all that you do. The, the 
specific example that you've provided about restaurants who never opted in or opted out and then keep coming back, it would be really helpful um, if you could put a word out to the association for them to grab some screen captures and some other information, but some, some specific examples for us. So when we are working with the other industries that we can show them, so it doesn't become a, a he said, she said type of scenario, but we've got some mm -hmm. facts on our hands. Yeah, um, it will We'll, I'll actually get with the attorneys that have been sent, have had to send cease and desist letters. Uh, one thing that was sort of an issue with this committee is we got feedback from restaurateurs and some third party delivery companies that they were very uh, intimidated to testify here because they feared retaliation against their businesses. So that was a direct comment from from many folks. I did hear that, and that's unfortunate because we're all really nice, right, guys? Yes. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Senator Ginn. Madam Chair, I hope you'll ex excuse the analogy, but I think you'd like to see that Georgia's a red state on that map. <laughs> yes, we would. <laughs> just, just having fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I do personally, this is really not a question of comment. I, I do find it a little odd that we have all these regulations and an agency, you know, Department of Public Health and the county levels overseeing everything. And then it's like, well, blah, blah. you know, I wish that the we got a response from some of the companies like, yes, we require these things. Mm -hmm. You know, even if we don't, mm -hmm. it would be nice if they do. But it seems like they're more all just kind of suggestions. Yeah. Actually, prior to um, in, in fourth quarter of 2019, we were actually working with the Atlanta City Council on a customer's bill of rights with third-party deliveries. However, we ceased working on that when COVID um, uh, happened. Um, again, we became the source of information for the industry. Um, we we were there to, to be the liaison between governmental agencies. I was appointed to, the, to GEMA to represent the critical infrastructure of food in our state. Um, Governor Kemp was very receptive to the fact that 53 cents of every food dollar is spent away from home in the state of Georgia. And so we are a very critical part of feeding people in the state of Georgia. Yes, true. And thank you to, for um, all the industry does and all the excellent you know, jobs provided. All right. Any further questions or comments from anyone on our committee? Hearing none. Um, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, just uh, a couple quick housekeeping items. If members of the committee could circulate to or just send Catherine an email, and maybe Catherine, you could send us an email with any comments, recommendations by October 12th. Um, well, right, but it's not the end of the line. So, so don't worry. Um, then Catherine will, Catherine will go ahead and circulate, uh, you know, the testimony notes, draft report by, I think we decided the 18th. Yes. And then our, our final meeting is November 1st at, at one, and that will be really to just adopt the report. So we'll be in touch about that. But but if you have any sort of proactive things that you want to send to, to Catherine at Senate Research, that would be great. Oh, and I was completely remiss um, earlier in not mentioning that Uber Eats provided our lunch today, which was delicious and saying thank you very, very much for doing that. So um, we are, we're, we're very grateful. Um, I think that was all of our housekeeping items. Catherine, do you have anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah. Which are you? Which number are you? Okay. You're on. Just to let you guys know, I've already sent emails requesting the guidelines that you asked for from speakers. So I hope to have that to you as soon as I get it um, so that you can use it for forming your recommendations. Oh, that'll be very helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, seeing no other business before the committee, um, we are adjourned and thank you everyone for your time.